It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker for today is Tamara Phillips. Uh, Tamara Phillips got her BA in psychology at uh, William Patterson State College, went on and got her PhD in experimental psychology, working with Bruce Dudek at SUNY Albany, and then did a couple of postdocs at Rutgers and at OHSU, where she stayed on as assistant professor. Uh, she went through the ranks all the way from when it was the medical psychology program up to behavioral neuroscience, and now she's been full professor there for, for a while now, which is fantastic. Uh, she's received a lot of awards for both teaching and research. I want to highlight a couple of these there, including a couple of teaching excellence awards that she got from the basic science graduate program, as well as the teaching, uh, teaching excellence award she got from that same program. Uh, she's received multiple awards from societies, including RSA, as well as, of course, she's our, our former distinguished scientist award from IBANGS here. Uh, she's been on a whole host of committees and study sections, editor, editorial review boards, and of course, she's also served as past president of IBANGS, uh, so we appreciate all of those services there. Uh, she's been engaged in a whole lot of, of activity with high school students, college students, and just very involved in the graduate training program at OHSU, more or less since she's been there, uh, which is impressive. Uh, she served as a PhD mentor for a variety of students, including many of whom are here, as well as uh, postdocs, some of whom are here as well. Uh, by my count, she's published over 174 original research articles, as well as 52 reviews and book chapters. That's an impressive number, and has collaborators all across the country and all across the world. And I think just all around, she's just a great model for how to do a career in science. So just spanning the generations and just uh, very influential in my training as well in graduate school. And so just uh, uh, thank you for all you've done, Tamara. And uh, we're very excited to hear about what you have to talk about today. Uh, so again, her research, of course, utilizes a lot of different genetic techniques, uh, some of which she'll tell us about today, selectively bred lines, genetically manipulated lines, a lot of different genetic mapping populations, and all of this aimed at the same question of, of what are the genes and the neural circuits that actually underlie these different responses to drugs, as well as preferences to, for drugs. And so with that, uh, I'll introduce, uh, just to take it away to uh, Tamara Phillips then. And so again, thank you for presenting with us. Thank you, Chris. That's really a really kind um, introduction. Let me see if I can share my slides. Do you see what I hope you can see or not? You're not yet? sharing yet. Okay, let me go back, share. There it goes. Okay. Oh, you got your notes view again. Swap your yeah, display. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working gotcha. On it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pushy. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so uh, just, just to tell some of you who may not know, the other thing that I'm doing now is chairing the Behavioral Neuroscience Department at OHSU. I skipped that. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you skipped that painful news, huh, Chris? <laughs> um, and... <laughs> And, and, you know, I, we obviously welcome applicants uh, to graduate school here in our department and postdocs to come study with us too. So uh, we'd love to have you, you join us. So I'm gonna talk about a story that some of you are well familiar with and some of you may not be. So I'll, I'll have to give some history to get you acquainted. And then I'll talk about what we've done and, and where we think we're going um, in the future with regard to this project. Um, so this is a discussion about uh, neurogenetic study of differential susceptibility to methamphetamine intake. Um, I've also done a lot of alcohol research in the past, but this has really been the focus of my lab for a bit now. Uh, I'm sure all of you know about methamphetamine. It's, it's something that, you know, it has been a, a large problem, certainly in the United States and in other parts of the world for a long time, sometimes referred to as speed or ice or crystal. Um, it is a very unpredictable drug, um, sometimes lethal, and unfortunately, overdose deaths have increased nearly fivefold since 2012. So this remains a very significant drug threat. We hear so much about opioids, but methamphetamine is really a very large threat as well. The most recent national survey on drug use um, and health actually showed that there are about 1.6 million people in the United States reporting using meth in the past year and that the average age of the users is 23 years old. And about a million had a methamphetamine use disorder, meaning that they're using very large amounts that probably are toxic uh, to their brains. And the highest avail availability in this country is in the Western and Midwestern United States, including in, in the Portland area. And that is in part why we decided that we wanted to um, apply for a NIDA funded methamphetamine abuse research center which we did and was funded um, between 2006 and 2018. And that's where this project started um, and then subsequently has been supported by UON and RO1 funding 
um, to myself. Um, some of the work going forward is work that I hope will be funded to support neurocircuitry analyses in which I'm collaborating with uh, Susan Ingram, who unfortunately moved to Denver, but we're still trying to carry on that collaboration. And then my student, Sam, Samantha Rios, is uh, hopefully getting an NRSA. We've been getting all the JIT requests and she has a great score to pursue some of this work as well. Uh, this figure shows trends in meth deaths among U.S. men and women aged 25 to 54 over the years, as well as um, death by race and ethnicity. And what you can see um, is an increasing trend and in that there are differences um, related to um, ethnicity with regard to how significant these results are. These vertical dashed lines indicate significant changes in the linear trends, and you can see that the changes are always in the direction of acceleration, unfortunately. So this problem is not getting better. And in some ways, concentrating on addiction outcomes by um, sex specific and culturally tailored um, issues is helpful, but hasn't been approached as much for methamphetamine for some other um, drugs of abuse. So that needs to be taken into consideration. The other thing I want to make a point about is that there is individual vulner vulnerability. Not all initial users go on to use regularly or to develop an addiction. Um, and that the environment influences sensitivity and the amount of drug used. So that's an important consideration as well. And this is well known from opioid treatment where individuals can take very high levels of, or opioid use, where individuals can take very high levels of opioids in an environment in which they're used to taking them. But if they move into an, uh, an unfamiliar environment, sometimes taking that dose can prove lethal. Animal research suggests that there may be some opposing mechanisms, tolerance, et cetera, that may um, not be engaged in that unfamiliar environment that prevent overdose death, that may not prevent it um, in this new environment. Now, I'm not going to concentrate on that. I'm going to concentrate on genetic factors that influence sensitivity and the amount of drug used. Um, this is a well-known thing for across all drugs of abuse that, um, that there are genetic factors that are very important. And I'm going to talk about our use of selective breeding as a tool for examining um, that genetic influence. And most of you I know are very familiar with selective breeding and with this particular figure because we've used it over and over again, thanks to um, Dr. John Belknap, who's no longer with us, who created this figure initially. So I, I, I just can't get rid of it because it just reminds me of him every time I use it. Um, this just sort of gives you an idea of how selective breeding is performed. Can you see my pointer if I use it like this? Yes, thank you. So in an initial population, and in our case, we um, created a genetically heterogeneous sample, which was the product of crossing the DBA and C57 strains to create an F2. Um, there will be variability among individuals, and this is to reflect that. For selective breeding, if it's bidirectional, you're choosing the highest scoring individuals, breeding them to produce offspring, and then testing those offspring or the lowest scoring individuals breeding them to produce offspring. And you're hoping over generations that you'll get a separation in the two populations, indicating that there is some genetic contribution to this trait um, and that you can then study these lines to try to identify what the genetic contribution is, which genes specifically are important for the trait that you're measuring. Now, in our case, we started with DBA and C57. Um, and this project started around 2006 um, because we had a lot of data for other uh, drug addictive drugs um, in these two strains and had lot, done a lot of gene mapping. And we wanted to be able to compare our results to our past um, historical results for other drugs. So that's how we initiated this. It could have also been initiated with a more genetically heterogeneous stock like um, the stock that came from the Institute for Behavioral Genetics. And now if you were going to do it perhaps from the um, HSCC that was produced at the Jackson Laboratory. Um, but for now, um, this is where we went. And I'm gonna show you results for some of this. Um, first, let me talk a little bit about the methodology. 
So we did a bi-directional selective breeding project. We started by testing 120 mice of the F2 population for methamphetamine consumption. Um, we're using a two bottle choice assay. We're not using IV self-administration in the mouse. Can you imagine trying to test 120 mice for IV self-administration getting actually as even half of those to work and then being able to do something like this? So we did work on IV self-administration for a while, but just didn't think it was tenable for this particular type of a project. So we moved to consumption. John Belknap had actually tested C57 and DBA mice for meth consumption and had found a difference. So we felt that perhaps there was a genetic factor there. Interestingly, he found, and this will become important later, that C57 mice consumed more methamphetamine than DBA mice. Okay, keep that in the back of your mind. So the order in which they also consume almost every other drug was C57 consuming more than DBA. Our procedure is an 18 hour two bottle choice procedure that starts three hours before dark through three hours after dark. And then there's this six hour period basically in which they don't have access to methamphetamine. So you might consider it as a withdrawal period or an abstention period. And we have found actually that mice consume more methamphetamine under these conditions when they have that withdrawal period each day. Um, we offer them a 20 then a 40 milligram per liter methamphetamine solution versus water for four days each. So it's only an eight day procedure. They have um, been acclimated for a couple of days prior to that to drinking from these tubes. And then the selection phenotype is how much they consume from the 40 milligram per liter tube. And we choose our highest and lowest consuming parents from, um, from those values. We then test 60 offspring per line per generation to result in the, high, the, the low and the high lines. So here are our results. We've actually performed this selective breeding project five different times at a two year interval. So every two years, we created a new F2. We got B6 and D2 mice from the Jackson Laboratory, created a new F2, brand new. So it can be considered as an independent experiment every time. And then we did our selective breeding for four generations. And what I've described to you is mass selection. So we only carry this out for four generations because we want to avoid excessive inbreeding in a mass selection project. That's a bigger concern. What I want you to see though, is that the F2s all consumed around two milligram per kilogram methamphetamine. The values were pretty um, stable. And that every generation, the high line, there was a very large immediate response in the first generation in the high drinking direction. In the low line, a couple times we didn't get much response and we got more in, in two generations. But by the end of these four generations, all of the low line mice were basically avoiding consuming methamphetamine, whereas the high line mice were drinking at least three times as much as the original F2. So very, very successful selection project. And these are all the individuals who really had a large role in producing these lines with Gina Wheeler being a postdoc in my lab and reporting the first set of lines. Zeni Shabani, also a postdoc as, as head author of the second paper that uh, reported the lines. And we've also reported the, a third um, set of these lines in um, Hitzman et al. most recently, um, where we show some transcriptomic results that I'll just briefly mention going forward. So very stable, extremely rapid, um, and I was very happy to see this. So. We then did QTL mapping on the first two replicates. So we took the parents, the high and low parents of each of this replicate sets, um, obtained DNA, and then did quantitative trait locus mapping, trying to identify where in the genome there might be important genes that are um, impacting this methamphetamine drinking trait. And I'm showing you each replicate here with the combined result, because like I said, these are independent studies. I'm also cutting to the chase to tell you that um, the important gene on chromosome 10, which is, which is right in the middle of this peak, is the tracemine associated receptor one gene. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So when I first saw these results, I didn't believe the first one because there's nothing, nothing, and then this huge thing on chromosome 10. So we did it again and was certainly convinced. And I was looking at these data and trying to figure out what was on chromosome 10. 
and saw that the mu opioid receptor was there. And that's where I thought it was at first. I thought, oh, it's OPRM1, because you know we all jump to conclusions about interesting genes on chromosomes right away. Fortunately, Aaron Janowski happened to come into my office as I was looking at this and asked me what it was and said, oh, TAR1 is right there. I, I knew of TAR1 because David Grandy here cloned TAR1 and had been studying it a little bit and knew that methamphetamine was actually an agonist at this receptor, a direct agonist. So we started to, after looking at OPRM1 for a little while, we also started to look at TAR1. So to give you an idea of what TAR1 is, um, this is the topology of the mouse trace amine associated receptor one. Um, it is a seven transmembrane spanning um, DPCR. Um, and uh, we actually discovered, and also on chromosome 10 between C57 and DBA mice, there are not very many SNPs. So that worked to our advantage um, in, in this uh, receptor. So and there's so much data in the databases now that you can look at for many different inbred strains that we were also lucky to just be able to look at these databases and discover that there was a single nucleotide polymorphism between the C57 and DBA mice right at this location um, where the SNP encodes a proline to threonine mutation and to discover that the DBA mice at the Jackson laboratory all had, all had, that particular mutation. So the DBA mice possess this unique non-synonymous SNP in TAR1. We then went on and genotyped every other inbred strain that we could get DNA from, get our hands on pretty easily, and found that it wasn't present in any other of the strains that we were look at, looking at. And we also, and I'll show you in a moment how we know this, found that it arose spontaneously. Um, so if I hadn't used the DBA by C57 cross for this project, I never would have found this gene um, because the mice, the eight strain cross that's used um, now by many for selective breeding projects that was produced by the Jackson Laboratory actually does not possess the DBA2J strain. Um, if I'd used the one from IBG, that cross would have had the strain, but they didn't have the mutation at the time that cross was produced. So sometimes, you know, you regret using only two strains in a project. I don't regret that in this particular project. So here's the chronology. We were able to obtain DNA samples, some archived at the Jackson Laboratory, some archived because we had been using these strains for so many years to try to figure out when this mutation arose. So just for history, the DBA mouse was produced by Little, um, one of um, Castle's students way back. We didn't have DNA samples from there. <laughs> so no surprise. So we couldn't do any DNA sampling back here. We just are showing you some of the history. Um, but we were able to figure out what the, um, the TAR1 genotype was of animals that had been originally produced in 74 and 81 and 84 and are now at different suppliers. Um, and from BXDRI, recombinant inbred strains that are produced in 69. And as you can see, all of them have this, what we're calling plus allele, the wild type or the reference allele. None of them have the mutation. Same thing in other uh, BXDRI strains that were produced in 91 or 98. And then these DBAs that we were able to pull out of the freezer, these DNA samples from 2001, still the DBA, even from JAX, doesn't have the mutation. So somewhere between 2001 and 2003, that mutation arose. So we know that it arose in that period of time and that it is now in existence in many of the BXDRI strains that were produced more recently because that's when the mutation was there, but not in others. Um, and, so, and the last one we looked at was this F219 generation and saw it there. So this is a spontaneously occurring mutation that arose at the Jackson Laboratory that does not exist in the DBA mice that you might purchase from other suppliers. So if you want to study this, don't buy your DBA mice from these other suppliers. Um, this brings me back to the point, remember I told you that John Belknap found that C57 mice consume more methamphetamine than DBA mice. 
he tested mice from back here that didn't have the mutation. So that difference in consumption was small and not driven by, couldn't have been driven by this TAR1 effect. And in fact, was in the opposite direction to what we now find. So the trace amine associated receptor, there are actually nine TARs in the mouse, six in the human, and all except TAR1 are expressed in the main olfactory epithelium. TAR1 is expressed in reward-related brain areas. Um, like I said, it is a, a, an intracellular stimulatory G-protein coupled receptor. It's responsive to trace amines, as the name implies, such as beta-phenylethylamine, and very importantly, methamphetamine and other amphetamines are TAR1 agonists. Um, binding to TAR1 triggers accumulation of intracellular cyclic AMP, so we have an assay to look at functionality of the receptor. And greater dopamine levels are found when there is absent TAR1 function, suggesting that TAR1 has a regulatory function over dopamine. So when it's functioning and there's binding to it, it reduces uh, dopamine activation. So here are some data to um, show you what um, happens in um, when we transfected HEC293 cells with GFP tag C57 or D2 like TAR1. Um, in uh, cells that were untransfected, there is no cyclic AMP response to methamphetamine as one would expect, and that's these blue circles here. Um, it's the cells that were transfected with the DBA transcript um, look very similar to an untransfected cell, no cyclic AMP response. Here's the response of the C57-like cells, large, nice response to methamphetamine that can be blocked by this TAR1 receptor antagonist EPPTB up until you get to extremely high levels of methamphetamine, which are probably having some nonspecific effect. You can see that both of these genes are actually expressing a receptor. If anything, the DBA is producing more of the receptor than the C57. You can also see that here. Um, so this tells you, you know, that there is a receptor being expressed. Uh, our most recent data though, using a labeled um, TAR1 agonist show that the, um, the receptor very likely does not bind methamphetamine. It doesn't seem to bind the rho agonist except at extremely high concentrations. So um, it's likely that the reason that the receptor is non-functional is the ligands aren't um, doing a great job of binding to the receptor. So here are some data for meth drinking based on TAR1 genotype. So the DBA is the mouse that has the mutation. They drink a lot more methamphetamine than the C57, very large difference. Our high line drinks way more than the low, and I'll talk to you about their TAR1 genotype in a moment. There was also a TAR1 knockout that had been produced by the Grandy lab that um, we were able to use, and we found that the knockout, so they wouldn't have TAR1 function either, um, consumes much more methamphetamine than the wild type. And there's some dominance of the wild type allele for the heterozygote so that they look more like the um, animals with the reference allele. So mice lacking TAR1 function consume more methamphetamine. We looked back at some DNA samples that we had in the freezer that we collected anew to look at TAR1, the mut mutation genotype in our selected line. So what I'm showing you here, for example, is in the the third replicate, the S3 generation, and that they have, all, they are all, every single one of them, um, uh, animals that have the mutant genotype. That was true also in the first generation of the fourth replicate and in the first generation of the fifth replicate, as well as the second. If you look at the low line, what you see is a mixture of um, heterozygotes and, um, Sorry, I don't have the label on here, but these are um, these are um, animals that have the TAR1 plus plus genotype. These are animals that have the TAR1 M1J plus genotype. So heterozygotes and homozygotes, because as I just showed you, there's dominance toward the heteros toward the homozygote toward the plus allele. So these animals would look phenotypically similar 
What's really astounding though, is by the first generation, all of the animals possess this um, genotype. I also wanted to show you what happens when you test the DBA mice from different suppliers for methamphetamine intake. Remember these different suppliers have DBA mice that don't have the mutation. They all avoid consuming methamphetamine. Only the DBA from the jacks consume higher levels of methamphetamine. There aren't very large volume differences, total volume consume differences among these animals. One of these down here has a higher volume. So you can't, this is not attributable to them just consuming more fluid. And it isn't in our animals either. So the next step we took to really prove that TAR1 had a role in methamphetamine intake, although I've just shown you quite a bit of data that would be suggestive of that, was to use a CRISPR-Cas9 approach to actually exchange the mutant allele with the reference allele on our high line background and look at the effect on methamphetamine intake. So here are the normal animals, the ones that have the usual mutant allele are high line and you can see how much meth they're consuming. When we changed this one single nucleotide, removed the mutant single nucleotide and replaced it with the normal, the methamphetamine consumption went down to levels as low as those found in the MALDR line indicating that this is really a major single gene effect in these animals and that TAR1 has a highly significant role. We got um, Alyssa Chesler interested in producing these um, CRISPR-ed uh, knock-ins on the pure C57 background and the pure DBA background as well, so that we could also look to see whether background would have an impact. So if you just look at the panel, on the left, these are the DBA. So remember, they would be like our high line with meth drinking. And so the DBA consume a lot of meth. You do the knock-in and change their genotype and you can see their reduction in consumption. We went to a higher concentration of meth, but this is 40, um, which is very similar to the drinking that we see in our high and, and low lines, although the high is a little bit higher often. We can do the reverse. We can take the, um, the normal allele and replace it with the mutant. And so the C57 normally drink this level, you put in the mutant allele, they become high methamphetamine consumers. So we can move it in both directions. Um, that has not always been the case for ethanol. It's hard, very hard to get a DBA mouse to drink ethanol under any condition whatsoever. So it's pretty striking that, I, that we can move it in both directions. The next obvious question might be that is the reason why these animals are consuming very different amounts of methamphetamine because they have differences in sensitivity to the rewarding or aversive effects of meth. So we asked that question using a condition place preference procedure. And this picture is thanks to Chris Cunningham who has used this quite a lot. Um, and I'm just showing you the conditions during testing. But imagine that during conditioning, you've got a wall in between here and the animals are sequestered on one floor and given saline and on the other floor and given methamphetamine. And those trials are happening um, on one per day with saline intermixed with meth, so saline and meth for 12 times. And then we're gonna test them and ask them, okay, which floor do you want to spend your time on after having associated one of these floors with methamphetamine? So this would be a test procedure. We do both a drug absent test, which is the usual test that people do, where maybe you give them a saline injection on that day or no injection, and you ask them to tell you which of these cues they like better. We also do a drug present test, which isn't done as commonly, where we ask, okay, what happens when you are in the drugged state with regard to your preference for each of these cues? Which one would you prefer to spend your time and here are some data. Let's look at this side first. This is the 50% line. So if they're spending no more time on one floor than the other, the drug paired floor, then they should be at about the 50% spot. This is the high line. You can see that they're spending more time um, depending upon the meth dose that they were conditioned with, and we've done multiple doses, on the methamphetamine paired floor. So at all of these doses, they're spending more time on the meth paired floor. The low line is actually showing neutrality under these conditions. This is the drug absent test. So they're not showing aversion, they're not showing reward. Um, when the drug is not in their system, they just tell you I could care less 
you know, either floor is fine with me. However, look at what happens when you actually give them the drug. Now, the high line at this low dose of methamphetamine is still showing preference, but that preference wanes with these higher doses of meth. Um, the low line is showing extreme aversion now. They are avoiding the drug paired floor when they are in the drug present state across multiple doses, including this very lowest dose of methamphetamine. So this indicates to us that there is a, a much larger both reward sensitivity in the high line and low sensitivity to the aversive effects in the high line. They experience greater reward, less aversion to methamphetamine. But does that have anything to do with TAR1? That doesn't tell me anything about TAR1. We know that meth impacts dopamine and, and other systems and glutamate levels. Um, so how can I say that that's just because they have this TAR1 genotype difference? Um, what we decided to do was look at a TAR1 specific agonist only in the MALDR mice because they have a functional receptor and the highs don't. So they should not, and we've shown in other um, assays that they're not responsive to these drugs and see what happens in our CPP procedure. So on this side, I'm showing you these doses, which were similar to the ones we tested for meth, the, high, the lowest and the highest. And you can see there's extreme aversion in both the drug-free and the drug-present test in the MALDR lines. So this drug is extremely aversive um, in these animals. We went down, way down in dose and still found extremely high levels of aversion. So it's extremely potent as well. We went way down again, just to see if we could find doses that didn't, weren't effective. And sure enough, at these really, really low doses, you don't see anything anymore. So this is um, dose dependent. The mice spend about 20 to 25% of their time on the drug paired floor, meaning they're avoiding it um, for doses as low as 0 0.05. So, and so their avoidance is actually much stronger than it is for meth, which makes sense because meth might be activating reward pathways at the same time that it's also inducing this aversive state, which is balancing out to some extent. And here you're only um, activating TAR1. We looked at our uh, crispr animals in this assay. Um, these are new data that haven't been published. And so now I can prove to you that the lines of animals that have this genotype, the mutant genotype, do not respond to the row agonist. So this is CPP again. Um, you can see they're right at about the 50% line, not showing any response to the TAR1 agonist in this conditioned assay, but when you um, exchange the mutant allele with the wild type allele, you see aversion. So we do believe that TAR1 is modulating this, it has a, has a role in this effect. Another trait that's been interesting is, is meth-induced hypothermia. We often think only of hyperthermia um, induced by meth, but actually some hypothermia can be seen early after administration. So first concentrate on this panel. You can see the highline mice actually showing a little bit of hyperthermia over time, which you might expect, but the low line mice are showing hypothermia that eventually recovers. Again, is it TAR1? We looked at the knockouts that Dave Grandy had produced and sure enough, we see nothing in the knockout animals with a significant hypothermia and dominance again toward the reference allele in the hets and the homozygous um, wild types. We said, well, is it truly just meth? So we looked at ethanol induced hypothermia at two different doses. Here's the two gram per kilogram. Here's the four gram per kilogram in the high, high and low mice and high and low. And you can see there's no difference in response to ethanol induced hypothermia. So it's specific to meth. We did this in the knockout, same thing, no difference between the genotypes. What happens in uh, with the Rho agonist, the TAR1 agonist, a very large hypothermic response, dose dependent, and again, the doses that I showed you before not having an effect. So it appears again that perhaps this effect of methamphetamine is being mediated through the TAR1 receptor. Um, and when we did this um, also in our MAHDR knock-in animals, um, you can see no effect in controls, 
um, which is what you would expect. They don't respond to this rho dose. But when you look at the knock-in, you now get this big response. So it all kind of fits together in some weird, perfect way that we never you ever see in science, except in this project where everything seems to be um, carefully aligned. So TAR1 signaling. Um, it, it's known that glutamate processes impinge upon dopaminergic receptors. And I'm going to talk about why we're focusing a bit on glutamate in a moment. The only way for methamphetamine to activate TAR1 is if it can get into the cell because this receptor is intracellularly located. It is a GPCR, but it is not on the external cell membrane. It is inside the cell. Um, some people think it's on the endoplasmic reticulum. There could be other intracellular membranes that it is on. We don't really know um, everything about it yet. But meth has to be taken in via the transporter in order to get access to the receptor. It's believed that there are two types of receptors, one bound to a stimulatory G protein that activates PKA, PKA and inhibits this row A, another bound to a, 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 this G alpha 13 that might be on this endoplasmic reticulum and has the opposite effect, stimulating row A and having an effect on glutamate transporter internalization. So if you impact glutamate transporter internalization, that means you can impact how much glutamate is sitting out in the synapse because it can or can't be transported um, out of the synapse. And that is of interest to us. So some of the data that have been collected by, um, oh, and those data I should mention are, um, were collected in, by Susan Ingram and Susan Amara and others that have been working with them um, to, to, to determine um, that information. Um, what they have also found is that methamphetamine actually potentiates midbrain um, dopamine neuron EPSCs, and that's shown here. So methamphetamine um, in both the rat and the mouse with the data summarized here, increasing um, NMDA EPSCs. We collaborated with the Ingram lab at one point because um, they had evidence that a particular um, subunit, the GLUN2B subunit had, had a role in methamphetamine effects like this. And so this row drug is not the TAR1 agonist. It's another row drug that is specific to um, glutamate receptors with um, N2B subunits. And we did a simple locomotor activity test here, asking if we could block the stimulant effect of methamphetamine with this row drug um, using what we often use in our lab, a procedure in which we habituate the animals for a couple of days to saline. And then on a third day, we give them uh, the drug treatments so what I'm showing you here is activity levels on day three, subtracting a baseline. What you can see is that there's no impact of the road drug on, in animals that were given saline. So maybe a very tiny amount of, um, of non-significant um, locomotor depression, but it really is non-significant because you can see at the zero dose, you see this as well. It's probably just further habituation. Whereas animals who get meth show stimulation, and then there's dose-dependent reduction in that stimulant response when they're pre-treated with this drug. So it seems that perhaps this GLUN2B subunit has some role in um, this effect of methamphetamine. Now, this collaboration is now moving in the direction of um, attempting to identify how TAR1 mediates aversion from a circuitry point of view. We think that perhaps the most significant thing that's going on here between our lines is this insusceptibility to the aversive effects of methamphetamine, which would then create a situation where there's greater sensitivity to rewarding effects and potentially relate, re, result in higher methamphetamine drinking. So we're now interested in what the circuitry might be um, that's important to this. So one of the things that, that Sam Rios, the graduate student in my lab, has been looking at is some of these, um, is, is using slice electrophysiology to look at midbrain responses to meth and whether or not the high and the low lines differ. And Dr. Ingram started this work uh, uh, 
a little while ago when we were talking about how to move forward with this project. And what you can very clearly see here is a much larger response in the low line mice to methamphetamine compared to the high line mice in midbrain dopamine neurons. This is summarized here with regard to percent increase in the EPSCs in that region, with the high line showing really virtually no methamphetamine response compared to the low. Sam has now extended this to look in the dorsal rafe because serotonin um, has a, a role in aversion and I'll talk about um, the circuitry in a moment. So she has done this in B6 mice initially. We don't have a lot of data yet in the um, high and lows, but will soon. Um, remember the B6 mice have the normal allele. So they're the ones that would be more similar to the MALDR. And you can see that um, in serotonin neurons, there is also an increase in NMDA EPSCs. So it occurs in both dopamine and serotonin neurons. So we've decided to focus on a region called the lateral habenula. Um, and this gives you an idea of exactly where, um, where that is. Um, we, it is part of the brain circuitry in, involved in aversion in general, not just drug aversion, but aversion. And that's been shown by a number of different investigators. And a lot of the circuitry with regard to what impinges upon the LHB and what the output regions are has been defined. This is a really nice review paper that, that shows this. Um, and what we're focusing on then is this LHB to dorsal rafe circuit. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. These are the reasons why we're interested in this, um, this region. Um, first of all, if you, if you talk about non-drug aversion, just general aversion, electrical stimulation of the LHB actually suppresses serotonin neurons in the dorsal rafe. We know that aversive stimuli also activate these LHB neurons, and that results in suppression of serotonin neuron firing and that these LHB neurons send monosynaptic glutamate projections to both um, dorsal rafe serotonin and GABA neurons. We also know that GABA neurons are activated by aversive stimuli. So all of these things um, kind of support our wanting to look there. If you look through the literature and try to find data for other drugs of addiction, um, there's not a lot of data for the LHB, but um, there, is a, a, there are some relatively recent papers for ethanol that showed that LHB lesions increase voluntary ethanol consumption, so you're reducing that aversion circuit, and they also block ethanol-induced CTA. And with cocaine, electrical stimulation inhibits cocaine-seeking behavior. So the bottom line then is that LHB activation appears to signal aversion and that there could be less activation of that circuit in the high line mice than in the low. We also have done some transcriptome analysis in our MA drinking lines, taking tissue from methamphetamine naive mice from the accumbens, the prefrontal cortex, and the ventral midbrain, and found that there was a lot of differential gene expression as you would expect in all of those regions. Um, and we also measure differential wiring. So how selection affects gene-gene connectivity and it was in that differential wiring analysis that glutamate-mediated neuroplasticity arose as a key difference between these lines of mice. So that's another reason why we have an interest in, in glutamate. So Sam has collected some data. Um, we need to collect a lot more. She needs to do a lot more counting in other brain regions. But first, we just looked at the LHB, and that's kind of been outlined here. And what you can see for CFOS, um, immunoreactivity, that in the low line, there's greater immunoreactivity than in the high line. Um, and, and this is meth stimulated. So if you, in the saline condition, the lines are similar. I'm not showing you a, a picture of that, but these are summarized data. But if you look at meth increases in CFOS, you can see that in the low line, there's an increase. And in the high line, there is no significant increase. So that also kind of supports the LHB might be of interest. So right now what we're hypothesizing is that the low line has a stronger glutamatergic circuit to the dorsal rafe that increases GABA-induced inhibition and um, so 
of, of serotonin neurons and greater serotonin inhibition results in higher levels of aversion um, compared to the high line. And that's the hypothesis that, that we've been just, that we're pursuing. So we suggest that the low line are so sensitive to aversive effects of meth that they're unable to experience dopamine mediated meth reward. If you remove that, as we did in the B6 mice, you remove that aversive component, you saw that those B6 mice increased their meth drinking. So you could just be removing that mask um, by changing the TAR1 genotype. We think that blockade of that LHBDR circuit would decrease meth aversion and potentially increase meth intake in the MALDR mice, something that we will be looking at. We also predict that stimulating the circuit would increase meth aversion and potentially inhibit meth intake. Um, and that these, that we can also use aversion assays to look directly at aversive responses. And these outcomes would demonstrate the importance of this circuit. So Sam just got great um, news that it looks like her NRSA is going to be funded. She's been giving them all of her JIT information. And I just thought I'd tell you what the first steps are going to be that, that she's gonna to take to look at this. So in her first aim, she's going to look to see if there are methamphetamine drinking line differences in, LHD, in LHB response to meth challenge. She's going to use retro beads um, that are micro infused into to the dorsal refay and then treat these mice with saline or methamphetamine and examine CFOS, uh, new N antibody, um, and look at activation. So she'll inject these beads, allow transport for a couple of weeks, acclimate the animals to being handled and injected, and then give methamphetamine or saline, euthanize the animals, and then quantify um, CFOS, new N, and the fluorescence, the beads in the LHB to see whether there's a difference in um, transport. That will be the first step. The next is an optogenetic approach where she's going to look to see if direct glutamatergic inputs from the LHB onto to dorsal refay um, serotonin and gabinurins are different between the lines. So she'll use a virus um, and, con and inject it into the LHB, wait, wait a few weeks for the virus to be expressed, take slices, do slice electrophysiology, and look at both serotonin and GABA neuron um, activity um, in the, door, in, in the um, LHB. There will be light activation of terminals in the DRs to selectively stimulate neurotransmitter release. And she'll do current clamp experiments also in the um, presence of methamphetamine. And then the last thing that we're interested in doing initially is, is using a DREAD approach for chemogenetic inhibition of the circuit to see if we can um, impact the, we'll first do a CPA study by giving um, CNO after the DREAD has been expressed and inhibiting the circuit each time methamphetamine is given so that methamphetamine can't activate it to as great an extent as it could before um, and see if we can impact CPA and the MALDR line mice. We're hoping that all of these approaches will give us some information about whether we're going after the right circuit. Um, if not, we'll have to go back to the drawing book and try to figure out what we're going to be looking at. Of course, we have to look at um, CFOS and other brain regions as well. And so I'll stop there and leave some time for questions um, and acknowledge my collaborators and all of my students and postdocs and technicians and acknowledge that, that Susie and Sam are involved in these most recent things, but all of these people are involved. And then support, of course, from not only um, NIDA, but also the Department of Veterans Affairs, um, where I'm also a, a senior research career scientist who provides the space and a lot of resources that I use. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank our speaker. And again, feel free to ask questions directly now during the session, or you can also type them in the chat if you'd like to do that. And uh, with that, uh, no. any questions for our speaker? Chris, do you want me to stop sharing or? Whichever you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, while we're waiting, I've got a question about the uh, the CFOS experiment. Uh, so I was just curious. Uh, it looks like you've got a big difference between the lines in CFOS activation. I guess that's the paraventricular nucleus right below habenula there. Yeah. That looks yeah. like a bigger effect than what you see in habenula. I mean, are you looking at hypothalamus at all? 
Yeah, we, like I said, should we have slices throughout the brain and just have a lot of counting to do. Um, right. There, It's entirely possible that what we're also going to see is regions that are involved in the differential rewarding effect, right, of meth too, that are not related to TAR1 activation. So yeah, we have a lot of yeah. So I agree with you. I know you can see it in that in that slide. Very, very big difference. Yeah. I have kind of a dumb question, um, but there's this theory about people who are obese actually not liking food as well. So maybe they're insensitive to the pleasure associated with it. So they kind of need to step harder on the pedal. And you had so much data about insensitivity in the knockouts. Can you, I mean, you're, you're saying that because they have a a stronger preference, they're more sensitive to that. But what, what do you fall on that? Or do you have data that would speak to that directly? Or you? So I, I think that because they lack the aversion, they're able to experience the rewarding effect, right? The low line is not able to experience it at all. So that explains their absence of consumption. So if you have, you're comparing animals who don't have any rewarding experience to animals that have at least some, right? Whether it's heightened compared to some baseline or not, you would ex still expect them to be the ones that would consume meth. So the, the, I think the example you gave is just a little bit different, um, which kind of also gets you to the question of, is this going on in humans? Um, and the fact that a lot of these um, agonists are being used right now and tested for potential roles in not just methamphetamine uh, uh, addiction, but in food intake, food reward, um, other drugs, other schizophrenia, anything that might have some dopamine role where TAR1 might be modulating that. And they're showing some efficacy even for drugs that are not direct agonists at the receptor, because I think they're changing that aversion reward balance um, that might be important. So unfortunately, with regard to the genetics in humans, we don't have the right data that we need because this looks like a protective factor. So what you really need is a whole population of people where you give them methamphetamine for the first time ever, and you ask them, did you find that aversive or, or would you like to use it again? <laughs> and, you know, ethically, we have a problem with doing that. Um, so we don't, we just aren't collecting that sort of data. I think there are populations out there where you might be able to get that, like ADHD populations where some individuals don't tolerate the drugs as well or find them aversive. But the question hasn't really been asked. And it's not asked when you study populations of controls or addicts, right? And look at gene mapping. So we have some work to do to find out if this is relevant to humans. Also got a question from Paul. That that experiment you just laid out sounds like something that, you know, like Harry DeWitt could do right. in recreational drug users. And she's done some studies like that, like with casein kinase genotypes. Yep. Um, uh, but my question was, it's kind of like Judy's. Um, but like, what about, what about non-drug? phenotypes, you know, what is TAR1 doing for us besides keeping us away from, from meth, like in, in a normal situation? I am assuming it's not th there to do that specific thing for us. Uh, so what is it doing? Like, uh, and then uh, uh, sort of another question is, what about cocaine, you know, a drug that doesn't get in into those internalized um, TAR1 receptors? Do you see, have you looked at that at all? So I think tar, what TAR one's doing is is modulating this, you know, monoaminergic systems, not just dopamine, but serotonin, norepinephrine, because it's not just dopamine that is um, at higher levels when there's non-functional TAR one. It's also serotonin, norepinephrine. So it's 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 there for potentially that reason, just like D one and D two kind of balance each other. I think it's there as kind of that balancer normally, normally. So um, is that does that mean you think that dopamine is going intracellular and then binding those intracellular TAR1 receptors? Dopamine. Because, sorry. Dopamine can activate 
tar one to some extent too. Yes. Okay. It's not just the trace amines, but dopamine as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so what, what about cocaine? Um, well, cocaine obviously doesn't get in there and act as an agonist at the receptor, but if you use dopamine, sorry, tar one agonists, you can reduce cocaine self-administration. Um, you can reduce um, self-administration of other drugs. So I, I think you're messing with that, that balance. It's mm -hmm. agonists that do it. You would expect with methamphetamine, you know, what would you expect to happen? If you gave an antagonist, you could potentially block meth binding to the TAR1 receptor and, and impact drinking. We don't have any antagonists right now that work in vivo. It has been a huge problem. I don't know why people have had a very difficult time creating TAR1 specific antagonists that you can use in vivo. That EPPTB mm -hmm. I showed you can only be used ex vivo. So we don't have that. Got a question in the chat. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. I, I just had a quick follow up, but in your selected lines, have you looked at any non drug phenotypes that are different? Have you seen any non drug phenotypes that are different in the lines? So, basal activity is similar, basal temperature is similar. Um, drinking of other solutions like sucrose or saccharin or quinine or sodium chloride are all pretty similar. Um, occasional differences depending on replicate. There's nothing that we see that seems to be hugely different at baseline. Cocaine responses are absolutely identical between the two lines, absolutely identical. So our, so is every ethanol response we've looked at. Thanks. This is maybe a follow-up to that, but a question in the chat, are there differences between the lines and things like MDMA sensitivity as opposed to cocaine? I'm guessing the answer is no, but if you clicked at that one. But. They, they are different in MDMA. They do a different MDMA, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. because they're, Every amphetamine-like drug, gotcha. <laughs> they, differ, they differ too, including um, neurotoxicity induced by um, some of these drugs. So the TAR1 mutants tend to be a bit more sensitive to meth-induced or MDMA-induced neurotoxicity. All right, and a question from Cameron. Hi, right, Cameron, great talk. Uh, Hi, so I have a question generally about um, body temperature. So. Do you think this could potentially be an interesting um, intermediate phenotype or physiological trait to do more mapping studies and looking at hypo versus hyperthermia and its relationship to the rewarding versus aversive properties of stimulants? I think that it is a really interesting intermediate trait. Um, John Moots in my lab did some work looking at um, other drugs as well, and whether or not those other drugs, sensitivity to hypothermic effects were related to drug consumption and found relationship with um, morphine as well. Um, I think that it's possible that this hypothermia is actually being associated with the cues that make meth aversive at the same time that meth's being associated with cues that make it aversive. So it's being carried along that way, potentially. But on the other hand, maybe maybe hypothermia is aversive to some extent and actually could be used as a marker of risk, right? Or actually protection from drug use. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's likely that it's gonna be much more mappable than, than behavior too, just because it's a physiological trait, which is why I'm super interested in it actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Paul has a question again, too. I got another question. Your experiment about uh, uh, the habenula to um, the dorsal rafe, um, it got me thinking about TAR1 expression patterns in the brain. Like, is it expressed in those brain areas? Um, to the best of our knowledge, we don't have a good antibody for it, but as best has been done with antibodies that are not perfectly selective, it appears that TAR1 tar is expressed in regions where there are dopamine and serotonin neurons because the transporter is important for, you know, methamphetamine access, um, unless the, so yeah. yeah. And that knowledge comes from trans, transcriptomic data? Um, it comes from using antibodies that were okay. perhaps not the most selective, but we hope at least, you know, it's not us <laughs> because right. uh, again, they just haven't been able to produce an antibody that's perfect for this. 
All right. Any other last minute questions? It was great seeing everybody. Thank you um, for your attention.